I'm delighted to welcome you to this brief and informal study of the book of Romans, this remarkable book in the New Testament, which as you know is the great summary of the theology of the great Apostle Paul. And we've been indebted to the Apostle for this wonderful summary of the truths of the gospel down through the centuries and indeed the millennia of Christian history. My plan is to engage in about 30 half-hour discussions that are going to be connected to this book, which means we're going to be moving at a rate of about one or two discussions per chapter. The book of Romans is 16 chapters long, and so we'll be spending about two sessions in each chapter as we go along. I appreciate having a small group here with me, and I appreciate those who are going to be watching by way of video. And our intention is simply to summarize this book in a practical way and hopefully make points that will be of use to you as you seek to engage in growth in the Christian life and also engage in ministry with respect to your Christian service. This uh, occasion we're going to be looking at the first half of the first chapter of Romans and using that as an excuse to do a little bit of background, try to talk a little bit about just why it was that Paul wrote this letter, what the circumstances were with respect to his life and what was exactly going on that inspired him to put pen to paper and send off this wonderful epistle to the church in Rome. But to kind of frame our discussion and get us going, let's go ahead and take a look at chapter 1 of the book of Romans. I'm reading from the New Revised Standard Version. You may have a different version, and that's just fine. It should be pretty similar. But let's read down to verse 17 of Romans chapter 1, and then we'll go ahead and take a look at this text. This is the Word of God. Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God, which he promised beforehand, through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. The gospel concerning his son, who was descended from David according to the flesh, and was declared to be the son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by resurrection from the dead. Jesus Christ our Lord, through whom we have received grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith among all the Gentiles for the sake of his name, including yourselves who are called to belong to Jesus Christ. To all God's beloved in Rome who are called to be saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for all of you, because your faith is proclaimed throughout the world. For God, whom I serve with my spirit by announcing the gospel of his Son, is my witness, that without ceasing I remember you always in my prayers asking that by God's will I may somehow at last succeed in coming to you. For I am longing to see you, that I may share with you some spiritual gift to strengthen you, or rather so that we may be mutually encouraged by each other's faith, both yours and mine. I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that I have often intended to come to you, but thus far have been prevented, in order that I may reap some harvest among you, as I have among the rest of the Gentiles. I am a debtor, both to Greeks and to barbarians, both to the wise and to the foolish. Hence my eagerness to proclaim the gospel to you also who are in Rome. For I am not ashamed of the gospel. It is the power of God for salvation to everyone who has faith, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it... The righteousness of God is revealed through faith, for faith, as it is written, the one who is righteous will live by faith. So there's the text that we're going to be considering. Let's just have a word of prayer and we'll get underway. Great God, we are deeply grateful to you for the mercies that you show to us day in and day out. We thank you for this wonderful book of Romans. We thank you for the millions of your people through history who have been encouraged by its deep and profound and significant and encouraging words. We pray that our reflection upon it as we begin this series just now would be blessed through your spirit and that it would use, you would use it to build us up in the faith and in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Well, how was it that the Apostle Paul came to write this uh, letter to the Romans? 
I suppose the only way to really talk about this is to go back and do a little bit of a chronology, and that's what I want to do this afternoon, is just simply kind of talk through some of the major events that took place in the first century and try to frame some kind of understanding about what was going on in the life of the Apostle Paul when he was there in the city of Corinth on his third missionary journey getting ready to write this letter. You may know that by traditional reckoning the crucifixion of Christ took place in 30 AD. We are told in the New Testament that in the 15th year of Tiberius Caesar, John the Baptist came preaching. The 15th year of Tiberius Caesar would be about the year 28, and that would be about the beginning of the time in which Jesus was involved in ministry. He was baptized by John the Baptist. He had a ministry that extended for certainly two years, maybe a little bit more, but eventually, of course, wound up in the city of Jerusalem, where he was tried, not for anything he had done, but really for who he was. He was executed, and of course, by Christian uh, teaching and Christian faith, he rose again on the third day, and thus began this great and wonderful good news, which has changed so many lives down through the history of the world. So Jesus came to Jerusalem in 30 AD. The Passion Week takes place. The church is born. We usually say Pentecost was the birthday of the church. Pentecost means 50 days. It was a Jewish celebration that would have taken place 50 days after Passover, basically 50 days after the crucifixion and resurrection of Christ. And that's when God poured out His Spirit and all kinds of things began to happen. And of course, the book of Acts is intended to give us detail concerning the events that happened with a particular focus on the way in which the gospel began in a largely Jewish community in Jerusalem, but gradually spread to an increasingly Gentile population. And that spread of the gospel from a basically Jewish kind of demographic to a more Gentile kind of population became the central point that caused sparks to fly in the first century. It's probably the principal reason that the book of Acts was written, and it's certainly at the very heart of the reason that Paul wrote the letter to the Romans. If you just read through the letter, you'll again and again be impressed at how often Paul is addressing himself to that sharp problem that was developing between a Jewish and a Gentile approach to the Christian faith. And that does seem to be part of what was driving the concerns of the apostle as he wrote this letter to the church in Rome. Well, probably in about the year 34, Paul has been converted. He had the Damascus Road experience. He indicates that he stayed three years in the city of Damascus. Damascus is north of Jerusalem, as you'll see on this map. And he was there, and of course we understand that during the time that he was there in Damascus, he was rethinking his entire understanding as to what exactly the significance was of the message of the Messiah. Who is this Messiah? How are we to understand him? And then after three years, of course, he returns to Jerusalem. If our chronology is correct, that would put his return to Jerusalem in about the year 34. That is about four years after the events of the uh, uh, gospel itself, the birthday of the church, and so on. He returns to Jerusalem, but of course, you know from the book of Acts, and you also know from the book of Galatians, that he wasn't very well received. There was still a lot of suspicion about this character, who was Saul of Tarsus, and whether or not he was actually a true and genuine convert to the Christian faith, or whether or not this may just be some kind of subterfuge on his part. But in any event, he indicates that he was there in Jerusalem for about two weeks, it was Barnabas, the son of encouragement, who stepped up and really became a mediator between Saul on the one hand and the apostles on the other. But even at that, Paul was only there for a brief period of time. And he indicates to us in the book of Galatians that he left Jerusalem and went back to his hometown of Tarsus, and he was there in Tarsus for some good period of time. Well, what's happening in the meantime is the gospel is continuing to spread. There was, of course, a persecution that took place in Jerusalem. This persecution followed from the uh, martyrdom of Stephen, 
that is also recorded for us. And this kind of uh, hostility to the gospel pushed Christian people out. And we hear in the book of Acts that everywhere they went, they went preaching the gospel. But they were forced to abandon their homes, at least for a time, there in Jerusalem. So this is going on in one of those places where the church is beginning to grow in a rather explosive and dramatic sort of way is in the city of Antioch. You'll notice here that Antioch on the map is a little north of Damascus and it became a center for Gentile Christianity and it's also not that far of course from the city of Tarsus where Paul made his home. Well in about the year 40 the church in Jerusalem sent Barnabas, who was a very trusted leader of the church at that time, to Antioch to investigate what was going on. Because the word that was coming to Jerusalem was that this church was being increasingly populated by a strong Gentile group of people. And of course in Jerusalem there was some concern about that. There was a prevailing attitude of course in Jerusalem that before you could become a good Christian, you had to first become a good Jew, you know. And that was the rising tension that was going on in the church. Well, Barnabas shows up in, in uh, Antioch. He takes a look around. He notices that everything is, is really just wonderfully uh, glorifying to Christ. And he's so encouraged about the picture that he sees there that he immediately decides to go and retrieve his friend Saul of Tarsus from that city that's just around the bend, as you can see, and bring him to Antioch. And so in about the year 40, both Paul and Barnabas are here laboring in the city of Antioch. And of course, during that time, we continue to see a wonderful growth in the life of the church and a wonderful uh, inclusion in that place of people who were Gentiles, nevertheless, who are being accepted in the life of the church. Now, the Apostle Paul tells us in Galatians, and we also hear in the book of Acts, that there was a famine. Historical records indicate to us that this famine was really widespread. It took place under the reign of Claudius Caesar, the successor to Caligula, who was the successor to Tiberius, if you know your Roman history there. And that particular famine seems to have taken place in about the year 44. That would coincide with Paul's remark in Galatians when he says, 14 years later, I went up to Jerusalem. The 14 years later is probably 14 years from his conversion, and we're putting his conversion back maybe a year or so after the crucifixion of Christ. So that would put us in about the year 44, maybe 45, in which Paul and Barnabas make a visit to Jerusalem. This is sometimes called the famine visit. It's the first time Paul has been back to Jerusalem since that very brief visit that he had back in 34. He shows up in Jerusalem and of course at that point there's interaction between him and the apostles. He delivers a gift that was assembled in the city of Antioch and otherwise is involved there briefly in interactions, but that seems to be the extent of it. A couple of years later, Paul and Barnabas are moved by God's Spirit to go on a journey. And of course, this has come to be called the first missionary journey of Paul. It took place between 47 and 48. It took place in a region that's not too far, really, from Paul's home. He goes down, first of all, to Cyprus. And then you can see he sailed north into a region that would be the southern Turkey, we would say today, southern Anatolia would be the name. He visits several cities there. He, he visits a city called Antioch of Pisidium. And then heading east, he visits the cities of Iconium, Lystra, and Derbe. And if you're familiar with the book of Acts, you know some of the adventures that Paul had in those places. I won't take time to rehearse all of that at this point, but I think you're probably familiar with that. He then returns from his first missionary journey back to the city of Antioch and he arrives back there probably about 48. That there was a sharp confrontation that took place between Paul on the one hand and Peter on the other, and that would have taken place right about this time frame, probably about the year 49. Paul tells us in Galatians that Peter came to the city of Antioch, and while he was there, he was engaging in fellowship with Gentile believers, but then 
when others came from Jerusalem, Peter began to withdraw and insulate himself, and Paul basically confronted him, called him on the carpet, and told him that what he was doing was not consistent with the gospel and was indeed not honoring to Christ and, and just basically gave him a very sharp rebuke at that point. We don't know exactly how Peter responded to it, but we do know that only about a year later there was a major gathering in Jerusalem in which this particular issue was going to be discussed. We call this the Jerusalem Council. It's recorded for us in the book of Acts, chapter 15, and in that context we hear that certain people had come to Antioch and were saying, unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. And obviously, those who were leading the church in Antioch had a little bit of a problem with that. Peter, uh, I should say uh, Barnabas and Paul, maybe Peter, all of them were uniting and saying this is no longer a good expression of what it means to be in the spirit of the gospel. And this gives rise then to what's called the Jerusalem Council. And the Jerusalem Council take pl takes place in 50 AD. It takes place in Jerusalem. It's recorded for us in Acts chapter 15. And again, I think you know that as a result of that council, it was determined by the leadership of the church that the imposition on the Gentiles of Jewish regulation was going to be rejected. Certain basic observances would be enjoined, but basically the Gentile converts were not going to be re required, certainly to be circumcised, to observe Jewish dietary laws, Jewish holidays, any such thing. They were going to be, re be relieved of all those burdens. Well, that letter that was generated became the reason for Paul's second missionary journey. And you re may recall that in about the year 51, Paul, along with now a new traveling companion, a man by the name of Silas, launched their second journey. And again, this map will indicate the route that they took. They revisited the cities that they had visited in, uh, in uh, central Turkey there. And then from there, they traveled on across Turkey and arrived at the city of Troas. And here at Troas, we find that they were dealing with the question, of where to go. It seemed that they were being uh, kept from going either north or south. And it's at that point, of course, that we hear of the Macedonian call. And the Macedonian call is that moment in which Paul, in a dream, hears somebody from Macedon beckoning for them to come and preach the gospel in that region north of Greece. And so in the uh, summer, probably, of 51, Paul and Silas travel across the Aegean there, and they have various adventures in these cities. You're probably familiar with these from the book of Acts. You know that they uh, were in Philippi, followed by Berea, followed by Thess Thessalonica, and each of those, of course, gives rise to wonderful stories that we have recorded for us in the book of Acts. From there, Paul travels down to the city of Athens, and in Athens, he gives his famous sermon that's recorded for us in Acts chapter 17. This is the only time we have an occasion where Paul is addressing a purely Gentile audience. It's an audience of philosophers who are said to be from the schools of the uh, Epicureans and Stoics, and Paul gives a wonderful expression of how the gospel should be communicated to those who don't necessarily have a background in the Bible. And he does appeal to nature, he appeals to a sense of God from general revelation, and he appeals to them to recognize the truth of God and the truth of the Son that was sent by God into this world who was vindicated by His resurrection from the dead. From there, Paul travels to Corinth. Corinth, you'll see, is not that far from Athens. And here in Corinth, Paul will stay for some 18 months. He arrives there in the fall of 51, and he's going to leave in the spring of 53. So for 18 months, he is basically the pastor of a church that he founds in the city of Corinth. And this church, of course, as you know, was plagued with all kinds of difficulties. You know that the church was populated by people who were converted out of the most rank forms of paganism, the Dionysian cult, and so on. Other religious expressions were there, which uh, really created some degree of difficulty for the church in its early days. And that's part of the drama that we find working out in the New Testament. In any event, uh, Paul does leave Corinth, and he travels back to 
uh, his home and arrives in Antioch in the fall of uh, 53. He's there for just that winter and then apparently launches his next missionary journey, which is in the spring of 54, and once again follows about the same route. He goes across Turkey, except this time he arrives directly in the city of Ephesus. And while here in Ephesus, he founds a major church. In fact, he spends more time in Ephesus than any other single venue during his career as an apostle. And he becomes essentially the pastor of that church. So he's there from 54, 55 uh, to the spring of 56. While he's laboring in Ephesus, you have another character in the New Testament we hear of somewhat frequently named Apollos, and he's over in the city of Corinth. Corinth was such a troubled city that at a certain point, Apollos finally left, and we get the impression he kind of left uh, very unhappy with the things, way things had worked out there in Corinth. When Apollos left, the people in the Corinthian church sent a letter to Paul asking counsel on certain issues, and Paul seized the opportunity to write back a major document that we, of course, know of as the book of 1 Corinthians. But there were other problems going on in the church, the book of 1 Corinthians did not seem to correct all those problems. Paul talks about a visit that he made to that church in weeping and tears. He talks about a severe letter that he wrote. All of this is in 2 Corinthians. He sent that letter by a character named Titus. Eventually, the Corinthian church does seem to finally mend its ways. Titus brings Paul word of the repentant attitude in that Corinthian church. And so as a result of that, Paul then sits down and writes 2 Corinthians. He writes it from Macedon, once again, and he expresses to them his deep uh, and abiding love and affection for them and his deep appreciation that they have changed their ways and really repented of the hostility that seems to have characterized them in an earlier time. And of course, the letter to 2 Corinthians details a lot of that information for us. Paul then arrives in uh, the fall of 57, actually, uh, there in Corinth. And he's going to spend the winter, he'll spend about three months, and then in 58 he's going to return to Jerusalem. It's during that three months, while Paul is there in Corinth, that he writes the book of Romans. His hope was that, having spent this time now in Corinth, he was going to return back to Jerusalem, he was going to be able to have contact with the Christians there, and his design, of course, was then to launch a, another missionary journey, actually a fourth missionary journey, in which he would be actually going further west yet and, be, uh, and arrive there in Rome. He did arrive in Rome, of course, but it wasn't under quite the circumstances that he had hoped. He writes the letter to the Romans to address what was a prevailing problem that was running through a great deal of the church, and that was this ongoing and abiding problem of how do we take the Jewish approach to the Christian faith on the one hand and the Gentile approach on the other and pull these two together. There was still a widespread understanding in spite of the Jerusalem Council and in spite of the powerful teaching of Paul and others that it was still necessary to more or less walk in lockstep with a highly Jewish approach to the faith before a person could then uh, truly count himself or herself a member in good standing of the Christian church. That was a problem that seemed to be present in the Roman church. It seemed to be present in many other places. And this is really at the heart of Paul's letter to the Romans. He's attempting to address that. And he wants to establish the great principle that a person is able to Dis, uh, put themselves in a position of being accepted before God strictly by faith. That there's no prior obligations, no prior cleanup activities, sacramental or otherwise, which sort of prepare a person for that. But as the great old hymn says, we come just as we are. And that it's the changed heart of faith that is the thing that becomes the instrument by which God pronounces us just. So justification by faith alone is at the very core of the message of the book of Romans. And the reason it's at the core is because Paul wants to say to those who are trying to put up additional roadblocks, this is the only thing that's necessary. Faith 
is what places us in a position of being accepted before God, of being justified in His sight. I would say the, the fundamental issue, the fundamental uh, message of the book of Romans is an attempt by Paul to answer this question, who are the true people of God? Who are the true people of God? There was a widespread belief, as we've indicated, among Jewish people in particular, that the true people of God were those who were born into the Jewish world and who were, in fact, by some means or other, legitimate Jews, and that that was what could give them claim to that status of being the people of God, the seed of Abraham. But Paul, of course, drops what amounts to a nuclear bomb on that in the New Testament, in the book of Romans, chapter 2, verse 28, for example, when he says, he is not a Jew who is simply one outwardly, nor is circumcision simply that which is outward in the flesh, you see. Who are the seed of Abraham? Those who are of faith, Paul says, are the seed of Abraham. They are not all Israel, who are simply descended from Israel, he says in Romans chapter 9. In other words, who are the people of God? Who are these people who can legitimately claim to be the seed of Abraham, true Israel, true descendants, truly those who are counted among God's people? And the answer is... It's those who have come to Christ by faith who have owned Him. As Paul also says over in the book of Galatians, if a person has been baptized into Christ, then he is the seed of Abraham by virtue of being in Christ and heirs of the promises made to Abraham and his seed. That is the theme. We're going to see it coming up again and again and again throughout the book of Romans. It is the main point that Paul is trying to drive home to us and we want to keep our eye on that theme all the way through as we go along. And Paul writes this message now from the church in Corinth to the church in Rome. And then, of course, you know that when he goes back to Jerusalem, he's arrested. He spends two years in prison there in Caesarea. He eventually does wind up in Rome, but he winds up in Rome in chains in 61. He's there under house arrest for a couple of years in Rome. There's a division of opinion as to whether or not Paul was executed at that point or whether he was released. We'll leave that discussion for another day. But we want to at least have this as the frame of reference for our present conversation. Who are the people of God? Paul's answer, those who are of faith. And we're going to see all the way through how that is the great truth of the gospel that he wants to build for us and it's on that basis that we, of course, can have this deep and abiding confidence that as we come to Christ in faith, we are accepted in the Beloved, we are accepted in the community of faith, we are accepted as the seed of Abraham, we are heirs of the promises God made to Abraham and his seed, we are God's true Israel, we are those who have this wonderful and rich and abiding confidence that we stand before Him, as Paul says to the Ephesians, accepted in the Beloved. We'll pick up this conversation next time, and until then, it's been a delight to be here with you.